Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our briefing today on the importance of staffing in nursing homes and the need for federal minimum staffing standards. My name is Lori Smetanka, and I am the Executive Director of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. So um, the Consumer Voice is the leading national voice representing consumers and issues related to long-term care. We work to achieve quality care, quality of life, and protection of rights for individuals receiving long-term care and services. We do that by advocating for public policies that are responsive to consumers' needs, empowering and educating consumers and families with information and tools they need to advocate for themselves, we train and support those who advocate for long-term care consumers, including citizen advocates and long-term care ombudsmen. And we promote the critical role of direct care workers and best practices in the delivery of care. So a few reminders as we get started, as you heard at the beginning of the broadcast, this webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides along with other resources will be posted to the Consumer Voice website after the program. Please use the question and answer box in your control panel to ask questions, which we'll get to at the end of the presentations today. And you can use the chat feature to make comments. You'll find links to the PowerPoint um, in the chat box. We'll be putting those in there as well, um, as soon as we can. So we wanted to hold this, um, this briefing today because as we all know, um, we have a chronic staffing shortage in nursing homes. It's been a serious problem for decades and has been exacerbated <clears throat> by the COVID-19 pandemic, both due to um, the loss of many staff members who either left the field or became sick themselves um, and were affected by COVID, but also because um, some of the short staffing that we had seen even before the pandemic that um, that became very apparent um, during the pandemic was due to the fact that so much um, so many facilities were relying on families to provide additional supports to their loved ones who are working in the facilities, which I think when that when they weren't available to provide those extra supports for so long um, because of the closures and facilities, the shutdown due to the pandemic, um, it really showed how reliant that we have been on other people instead of on having sufficient staff in the facilities. So weak staffing requirements, um, federal staffing requirements combined with woefully inadequate state standards has perpetuated the problem um, for staffing and has resulted in significant harm and negative consequences for many residents who are not getting the care that they need. So we have an opportunity right now to take steps forward in addressing the staffing issues that exist. In the House past version of the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill, there are a number of provisions that would lead us in the right direction. The House bill, as you see on the screen before you, includes a process for establishing minimum staffing requirements by directing the Secretary of Health and Human Services to conduct a new study looking at staffing levels and then using those results to promulgate regulations which would require minimum staffing levels. It would also require nursing homes to have a registered nurse on duty 24 hours a day, which is not currently our standard. And as you can see on the screen, there are other nursing home related provisions that would work to improve the survey and oversight process, improve accuracy and reliability of the data, and require auditing of cost reports. And as the Senate is crafting its version of the bill, and as the, there will be um, debate and, and looking to pass the, the final bill, um, there's tremendous pushback from the nursing home industry around including these provisions in any bills moving forward. And so, you know, we really are looking to um, include these these provisions in, in the bills moving forward because we owe it to residents, particularly after the devastation that has been experienced during the pandemic to ensure that they receive the necessary care and services to fulfill the promise of the nursing home reform law, which is for each resident to attain or maintain their highest practicable level of well being. And staffing is key to achieving that goal. And without adequate staffing standards, we are not going to get there. So today you're going to hear from three experts. I'm just going to 
pull them up, um, who will talk about the research and the data showing the importance of staffing and why we must address this now. It makes sense for improving quality care and it can be done financially. So first we're gonna hear from Charlene Harrington, who is Professor Emerita of Sociology and Nursing at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the School of Nursing, the University of California, San Francisco. Charlene is a gerontologist who's been a professor of sociology and nursing at the University of California, San Francisco since 1980. She was elected to the American Academy of Nursing and the National Academies of Medicine. Her research has focused on long-term care consumer information systems, home and community service programs and policies, nursing home quality, staffing, regulation, ownership, and financing. She's a member of CMS's Technical Advisory Committee for the Medicare Nursing Home Compare website, serves on editorial boards, and has testified before Congress, and has written more than 250 articles and books. During the pandemic, she's conducted research on nursing homes and COVID-19 infections, and written commentaries on staffing, transparency, financial issues, and nursing home design. Then we're, we'll hear from Richard Mollett, who's the Executive Director of the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to improving care for individuals in nursing homes and other residential care settings through legal policy and research, advocacy, and education. Richard has researched and published on a variety of long-term care issues, including dementia care, nursing home and assisted living standards, the rights of older adults in residential care, abuse and neglect, and crime in nursing homes, nursing home financing, and the imposition and use of penalties for substandard residential care. And then we'll also hear from Robin Grant, who is the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. And in this capacity, she's responsible for leading the development and implementation of the Consumer Voice's public policy agenda and growing and mobilizing the grassroots network to support the organization's policy work. Prior to joining the Consumer Voice, Robin was the Long-Term Care Policy Director at United Senior Action from Indiana and a consultant with the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Resource Center. She was also the Indiana State Ombudsman for eight years and president of the National Association of State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Programs for two terms. So we're gonna turn it over to Charlene and Charlene, as you're ready to move your slides forward, just say next slide and Libby will advance your slide for you, okay? And we're pulling those up now. Go ahead, thanks Charlene. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, nursing home staffing issues and to give a little background and context to uh, the, the presentation today. So next slide. Um, of course, we all know that nursing home residents are highly vulnerable. They're generally older and they have multiple chronic conditions. Many have dementia, and they're very frail and they need extensive help and they take multiple medications. So it's not surprising that they were so vulnerable during the pandemic and that so many had uh, COVID infections and deaths. Next. The nursing homes have to provide basic nursing care. And this is very labor intensive and it has to be done 24 hours a day. Most of the basic care is conducted by certified nursing assistants about uh, who are 60% of the nursing staff. They provide assistance to residents with bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring residents from the bed to the chair to the toilet, uh, with eating, walking, and all uh, the basic care during the day. They have to provide the same care in the morning and the same care in the evening. And what many people don't know is that it often takes more than one person, two or even three people to assist residents in moving, being moved up in the bed or transferred to the chair or to the toilet. And uh, licensed practical nurses are an an essential component of the nursing home staff. They have about 12 to 18 months of training and they are the ones who generally provide medications and treatments and care coordination and communication for the residents. Next slide. 
But I think that people don't appreciate that nursing care is highly complex and it requires registered nurses on a 24 hour basis, seven days a week. Uh, even, uh, registered nurses are trained. They have two to four years of training and they're specifically trained in infection control and planning and management. In fact, they're the only staff within the nursing homes that generally have this expertise. They are also the only ones qualified to conduct comprehensive resident assessments and care planning. They are critical for the identification and the treatment of infections and for chronic and acute conditions. And also they're important for the surveillance of residents and resident care. And by surveillance, we mean uh, they are crucial for uh, handling emergency situations. If a resident falls and hits their head or breaks a bone, they're the ones who are needed to determine whether uh, something serious has happened and if a resident is, needs to go to the hospital. They're also the ones that diagnose whether a resident may have had a heart attack or a stroke or other urgent conditions. They're essential to the coordination and the communication with all the other services that are provided in a nursing home, including like the medical, the dietary, the therapy, the pharmacy and other services. And they're the only ones who are trained and they're required to supervise the licensed practical nurses and the CNAs. Next slide. Uh, there have been many, many studies that show that nurse staffing levels, especially RN levels, are associated with higher quality of care. <clears throat> These many studies have shown that uh, the higher the staffing, the better the processes and the outcomes of care. And it's better, it helps improve the functional levels of residents. Higher staffing is related to reduced incontinence, urinary tract infections, pain, pressure ulcers, weight loss, dehydration, and studies showing the lower use of antipsychotics. In addition, if you have higher staffing, you have less re restraint use, fewer infections, fewer falls with injuries, uh, less hospitalization and emergency room use, and less missed care provided to the residents. They're also crucial for reducing adverse outcomes and lower mortality rates and fewer deficiencies. Next slide. Before the pandemic, most nursing homes did not meet the staffing levels recommended by previous research studies and by experts. In fact, one study showed that 75% of homes almost never met the CMS expected RN staffing levels based on resident acuity before the pandemic. Over half of the homes didn't even have a licensed nurse on duty every shift as they're required to have for up to 30 days during a year prior to the pandemic. And uh, currently and before the pandemic, we know that staffing levels are 15% lower on weekends and holidays. And of course, the turnover rate of staff is extremely high. This nursing staff turnover is related to the heavy workloads and to the low wages. And of course, this was all compounded during the pandemic. Next slide. Okay. The COVID-19 virus had a devastating effect on the residents. And the research shows that staffing was an important factor to mitigate against the infection and death rates. 
In California, we found that nursing homes were two times more likely to have resident infections if RN staffing was less than the recommended 0.75 hours per resident per day. In Connecticut, every 20 minute increase in RN staffing reduced COVID infections by 22% and reduced death rates by 26%. Another study showed that higher nurse aides and total nursing had lower COVID-19 outbreaks and deaths. And a very important study, a recent study showed that nursing homes that had the highest star ratings on the Medicare um, nursing home compare um, website, which included higher RN and total staffing and other quality ratings had fewer COVID deaths. And another study showed that higher staffing was related to lower staffing shortages. Next slide. So we've known for over 20 years that the minimum staffing levels uh, recommended in a research study for CMS and recommended by experts is needed to prevent harm and jeopardy to re residents. We know the minimum staffing for the lowest acuity should have at least point of 45 minutes of RN care per resident per day, which is 0.75 hours per day. It should have 33 minutes of LPN staffing. And each CNA should only have seven residents to care for on the day shift and the evening shift and 15 at night. And yet we know that many nursing homes give uh, nursing assistants between 11 and 15 residents a day to care for, and they simply can't get the work done. Overall, the total staffing should be 4.1 hours per resident per day. And of course, higher staffing is needed and it's also required under the federal uh, law for higher acuity residents. And yet many nursing homes are ignoring this requirement. And we uh, have also developed standards for what those staffing levels should be for each of the different levels of acuity. And that's available to nursing homes. Next slide. Next, ne okay. In conclusion, I'd like to say that Residents deserve to have adequate staffing, especially RN staffing 24 hours a day, every single day. They deserve to be protected from infections and to have the highest quality of care. And nurses and nursing staff in nursing home are heroes and they deserve to have reasonable workloads, a living wage and a comfortable, safe working environment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Richard Mollett. Um, thanks, Charlene. That was really um, so thoughtful and so succinct about so many of the, the staffing issues that are important. Um, and thank you, Lori, of course, and Robin, the Consumer Voice, for inviting me to speak. So I'm going to talk about some of the data that underlies some of the issues that Charlene was talking about. Next slide, please. As um, I was listening to Charlene and seeing all the people who've joined and now we're up to 306 participants and I see a lot of familiar names, but also um, you know, see that people are ombudsmen and advocates from around the country. Uh, hopefully this information, what Charlene has provided in respect to the knowledge and what is needed and why the staffing is so important and some of the data that I'm gonna present next will be useful to you all because it's so important as, as Lori was saying earlier that we speak out in support of these provisions in the Build Back Better bill. This may be our only chance for a long time to really move the dial and to address some of the longstanding as well as some of the more acute problems we've seen in the past year and a half uh, to make a difference in the lives of residents. 
Um, so just a little bit about my organization. I'm with the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, and we mostly focus on policy, research, and analysis, including providing a lot of the data, working a lot of the data, I should say, and providing it to the public, some of which I'll talk about today. And we're also, speaking of ombudsman programs, we are home to two local long-term care ombudsman programs in the Hudson Valley in New York. And our website is nursinghome411.org. Everything that I talk about today, and we also have a lot of other resources on dementia care and residents' rights, uh, nursing home oversight, et cetera, are all free and available on our website. Next slide, please. So what I first want to talk about in terms of staffing is just to give a little bit of a background of what, what are the staffing? So historically, and when I first started close to 20 years ago now, nursing home, everything we knew about nursing home staffing was self-reported by facilities. It was for the two week period before their annual inspection. And there were longstanding concerns, certainly things we heard about from residents and from families and from ombudsmen um, that the facilities would ramp up their staff um, in the time when they expected their annual survey to happen. And then studies came out corroborating what we were hearing from residents and families that facilities are um, significantly understaffed and then they tend to staff up a bit in, when they're expecting their annual survey. And as a result, there were concerns again about the integrity of the information we knew about what as Charlene said is so vital to resident care. Uh, so as a result of those concerns in 2010, uh, Congress passed and President Obama signed into law the Affordable Care Act, which among other things, so-called Obamacare, as many of you probably know it, it required nursing homes to report on a daily basis for every single day of the year, their staffing for RNs, LPNs, CNAs, for a range of non-care staff that are important as well, pharmacists, medical directors, social work staff, et cetera. And those data have to be, pay, be based upon actual payroll records, and they have to be in auditable files. So a world of difference from what we had historically is that now we have really good data on, um, on nursing care. It's not perfect. There is some fraud there, and, but there's at least a means of addressing that and, a, um, and strong backing for or, or substantiation for what facilities are reporting every day in their staffing. Now, it's important to note before we move on that the even though the law passed in 2010, it actually wasn't didn't begin to be implemented until 2015. And so the public information started becoming available in 2017 when CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, felt confident enough that the data were accurate and that enough facilities were reporting and virtually all facilities report their data. Um, those data are reported again for every single day, but just so you know, they're reported in quarterly files. So if you go to CMS's website, you can see the file for the for a specific quarter, and that's after it's been vetted and, and quality controlled by CMS, but it is for every single day of the quarter. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is really the, the reporting for the last quarter that is publicly available, which is the second quarter of this year. Uh, next slide, please. So this is again, um, based upon the most recent quarter, which is the uh, second quarter of this year. But frankly, the, the data have been, they fluctuated a bit with COVID-19 and through the pandemic, and they fluctuate from quarter to quarter. We, we publish these data in user-friendly state files, which I'll show you very quickly uh, towards the end of my, my part of the presentation. But the, the data have fluctuated a little bit. There was a larger study that showed that nursing home staffing actually really didn't go down that much um, during COVID, the COVID pandemic, but we are seeing lower census and um, again, lower staffing. And as I'm sure you know, anyone who's, who's concerned about these issues is there's been a lot of press about really low staffing. I would say just to, you know, to give a larger view on that is that from our perspective and my understanding, I would say that Staffing, as we're saying, as we know from the data, the staffing didn't go down that much in terms of hours per resident day, 
However, what we saw with the absence of visitation, the blockade put on, on families and friends of residents for a good part of the pandemic and just loosening up over the last, I would say, couple of weeks or a couple of months, is that the facilities were relying on the free care of, of residents, families, and friends. And in the absence of that free care, we saw how critical um, staffing is and how critically low staffing is. So a little bit about what the data are showing now. What we found is really um, piggybacks off what Charlene was saying about the 4.1 hours per resident day, that's what HPRD here is in my slide, that the typical resident needs at least 4.1 hours of nursing care staff just to meet his or her basic clinical needs. I'm not talking about care with dignity, not being uh, talk, uh, talking about being treated kindly, just to, to ensure that the resident doesn't have those adverse problems that Charlene mentioned on one of our slides. The data indicate that less than a third of U US nursing homes are meeting that total care threshold. Um, we found that the average total nursing staff hours per resident day were three and three quarters um, in the second quarter of 2021. The average RN staffing, which as Charlene was saying, is absolutely critical. Study after study has shown that how important RN staffing is to nursing home resident safety. Um, that the average was only 0.66 hours. As Charlene mentioned, the typical resident needs at least 45 minutes, 0.75, three quarters of an hour. A couple of bullets I just wanted to mention because I thought they were interesting and particularly relevant to what we're talking about today. So the average total resident census, that's the number of residents in US nursing homes climbed by 29,000 uh, in, in the second quarter of this year from the first quarter of this year, meaning that residents census is going up, meaning that facilities are taking in residents, they're accepting residents, even though we have this issue that everyone is reporting on in the news, that everyone is seeing on the ground in their nursing homes of poor staffing and really, really poor conditions, uh, worse than I've ever seen in, in the two decades that I've been doing this. Uh, so what does this say? This says that in the absence of some of the standards that Lori was talking about at the very beginning that are so essential in the Build Back Better bill, that in the absence of those standards, facilities are taking in residents even though they don't have the staff or the ability to meet their basic needs. Lastly, I just wanted to mention that contract staffing has gone up a bit. It's now accounts for 5.75% of all nursing staff hours. And that's important because we know, and the Consumer Voice has done some tremendous work on this over the years, that um, consistent care uh, matters. That's having consistent assignment of staff to residents, where the staff and the resident get to know each other, where it is a good situation, a good place to work, for the staff and where residents are monitored and cared for by people that they know and people who know them is really important. The use of contract staff indicates and the high use of contract staff indicates that facilities are not investing in care staff that are really part of their nursing home community. And so lastly, I just, you know, together, uh, as I know here on the slide, the failure to ensure that there's adequate staffing um, by the federal government for many years now destabilizes the industry. And of course, as Charlene was saying, and as we see here, puts residents at risk. Next slide, please. So, you know, the industry has claimed for many, many years, well before my time, when I read old congressional testimony from the 80s on through 2021, they don't get enough money to hire enough staff uh, and or they claim that they're just simply not enough nurses or potential uh, nurse aides or actual nurse aides out there for them to hire. And that is just not true. It's, it's very self-serving and it is something that really undermines the, as I was just saying in the last slide, undermines the industry in terms of its viability for residents and families, but also undermines on a day-to-day -day basis resident care. So the converse of the first bullet on my last slide is that Yes, um, two thirds of facilities are not meeting the 4.1 hours per resident day of nursing staff, but one third of them are. It's possible. It's not like only one or two out of a thousand are doing it. 
one third of nursing homes are doing. And in addition, in relation to the 24 hour RN requirement that we are all fighting for in the Build Back Better bill, over 75% of facilities already have enough RNs for 24 hour coverage. It's only 25% of facilities that just don't have the staffing there yet. But as Charlene was saying, this is critical. Um, we know that it's critical. Everyone who's been in a nursing home knows that having someone who has the professional background, who is able to do a resident assessment, who is able to manage medications, et cetera, how important that is. The issue is, is that we just cannot count on nursing homes, which more and more are corporate owned, more and more are highly corporatized, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, they're very sophisticated companies, we cannot count on them to be doing the right thing. We need to have the rules in place. And so we looked at the, uh, at the costs for doing this. You know, what would it take to move those 25% of nursing homes who don't have enough RNs on staff to, to, uh, to achieve 24 hours right now? How much would it cost? And what we found was, and this is based upon federal data, and we have those data on our website, nursinghome411.org, is the average cost to shift to 24-hour RN staffing is $61.82 per facility per day, not per person, per facility per day. And the range, the cost, because some facilities were really close to it, some facilities were further behind, the cost range per facility per day was from three cents a day to $141.15 per day. And this is based upon, okay, it's what the industry is arguing, excuse me, is that they're saying, oh, this is gonna cost billions and billions of dollars, $10 billion, $12 billion, I saw in, the, in a news report the other day. In fact, you don't have to go out and hire a whole bunch of RNs um, and a whole bunch more staff. All they would need to do to meet the 24 hour RN, a basic threshold of a skilled nursing facility, what they should be providing is to replace some of those LPN time with RN time. And the difference in cost is about $9 an hour, if I remember correctly, per person. So that's where we're getting this from. And again, we have all those data that you can use in your advocacy uh, on our website. So the actual cost of achieving 24-hour RN staffing for the nation is $75 million a year, not 10 or $12 billion a year. And importantly, we spend $173 billion on nursing home care. The cost to achieve 24-hour RN would be less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of those costs. Uh, nursing homes, as Charlene was saying, are required to provide 24-hour skilled nursing care. Uh, we think that our residents are worth that. Next slide, please, sorry. So I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of the data resources that we have on our website because they also could be useful for you if you're working with residents, uh, if you are a resident, but also to support some of the advocacy, uh, some of the conversations that we hope that you'll have with, um, with your representatives, both in the state, but especially members of Congress and senators. Next slide, please. So we have a, uh, a map on our page here, it's nursinghome411.org forward slash states. You can go there and you can click on any state and you can get state specific information on the staffing, including all the staffing that I spoke about before, but also nursing home uh, ratings, Amazon resources. We have information on highly and poorly performing facilities, uh, antipsychotic drugging rates, as Charlene mentioned, that is a very serious issue in our nursing homes as well, uh, to better understand what is going on. And that information is useful if you're selecting a nursing home, but also if you're working to make things better in a nursing home. And if you are a state or federal legislator, to find out what's going on in your region in, in, in your, with your constituents. Next slide, please. So this is very quickly, maybe a little bit hard to see, but I just wanted to show how the data are sortable and searchable. So again, we take that federal file, the quarterly file of the PBJ payroll-based journal staffing data for every single facility for every day of the quarter. And we put it, we average it and we put it into state files. So people can easily select, as I show in the blue um, uh, uh, 
snippet here that a single facility just by searching for the facility name in your state file, or you could look up county facility. So you could select one or more counties as we did in the bottom in the green picture below that. And so that's a good way to see, especially if you are a member of Congress or working for or with a member of Congress or a state legislator, what is going on in the counties in your community? And what can we do? What needs to be done to achieve better staffing? Next slide, please. I wanted to quickly mention, we actually just came out with two reports. Uh, we did a, a, a national review of state oversight of nursing homes, well, state, and I should say federal oversight. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure, you know, the state departments of health or department of public health are responsible for overseeing nursing home care and the federal agency, the Census for Medicare and Medicare, Census for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, is responsible for overseeing them. And as we know, you know, it's not no surprise to anyone that most nursing home care is frankly pretty crummy and nursing homes are not good places to live or to work. Um, so what we did is we put together a lot of data that again, can be used to substantiate what is going on in, in our nursing homes and to what extent are the residents' rights that are so essential, what extent are they being realized in residents' lives? And we're gonna have a webinar on this uh, in a couple of weeks. There's a link to it here, but you can find it, of course, on our website, nursinghome411.org. Uh, and that webinar, our next webinar, is gonna talk about the data and how to use those data in a way that is easy and accessible and understandable for you and the people that you're working with. Next slide, please. That's it for me. So I'm gonna hand it over to Robin. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. Um, so as, as Laura said, um, I'm Robin Grant with Consumer Voice. And I can say uh, without um, doubt that in our office, the number one complaint that we hear from residents and families almost on a daily basis is that there aren't enough staff to provide the care that residents need when they need it. And one of the major reasons for insufficient numbers of staff is that federal law and regulation which apply to all nursing homes that receive funding from Medicare and or Medicaid are inadequate. Next slide, please. There is no federal requirement for a minimum staffing standard. So the required, as many of you know, is just that there be sufficient staff to meet the needs of each resident, which is ambiguous, uh, vague, and subjective. There's also no requirement for a registered nurse or RN around the clock, which we also refer to as a 24-hour RN. While the requirements um, do call for a nurse around the clock, that can be a licensed practical nurse or an LPN. So the only requirement specifically for an RN um, is that there be one eight hours a day, seven days a week, which comes to a grand total of 4.8 minutes of direct care time per resident per day. So in the absence of strong federal staffing requirements, the only way to ensure staffing levels are adequate is through state requirements. So each state establishes its own requirements that are set forth in the state's nursing home regulations um, and sometimes in statute. So each nursing home in a state must then comply with those regulations to receive a license to operate in the state. So state standards become critically important because they can provide the protections that the federal staffing standards fail to provide. So that's why Consumer Voice believed it was essential to know exactly what those state standards are. To that end, we conducted research to identify each state's staffing requirements and then converted them to hours per resident day so that we could compare standards across states and compare them also to the recommended staffing standard of 4.1 hours per resident day. We also looked at whether or not a state mandated um, a 24-hour RN. The findings of our research 
are very disturbing. Next slide, please. So first, even though CMS's own research shows that you have to have a minimum of 4.1 hours per resident day just to prevent poor outcomes, in the entire country, only DC meets that standard. And in fact, DC slightly exceeds it with a requirement of 4.16 hours per resident day of total nursing staff time. And to explain, um, in our report, we have defined total nursing staff time as the total amount of time that a state in its regulations specifically requires be provided by RNs, LPNs, and CNAs together. So our analysis found that aside from DC, the total nursing staff time for all other states is below and often significantly below the levels recommended by the federal government study. The majority of states, and that was a total of 29, require less than 3.5 hours per resident day. 13 of those states require only two to 2.49 hours per resident day, which is approximately half of the recommended level. And one state, Arizona, actually requires less than one hour per resident day. In addition, there are 18 states for which we couldn't even calculate total nursing staff time because the only requirements they have are for registered nurses and licensed practical nurses with nothing spe um, specified at all relating to um, certified nursing assistants. Um, so we couldn't come up with a, um, a total for all nursing staff um, at all for, um, for 18 states. Uh, next slide, please. So our findings related to state requirements for registered nurses are equally troubling. Only six states required uh, um, registered nurses 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can see what those states are. They're Colorado, Connecticut, DC, which I realize is not technically a state, um, Delaware, Maryland, and Rhode Island. So they all require an RN um, round the clock, regardless of facility size. At the same time, we do have eight states that require an RN around the clock only if the facility is a certain size. Um, that size ranges from um, more than 60 beds, uh, which is the case in Pennsylvania, to more than um, 150 beds in New Jersey. And when you put that all together, that's only 14 states. So, um, not, not, not very many at all. Um, you may wonder why having an RN round the clock is important. Um, and I think Charlene did um, a fabulous job of explaining the expertise and skills and um, knowledge that um, registered nurses have. This um, is in no way meant to disrespect um, licensed practical nurses. Um, but it's just that uh, registered nurses really are the only um, nursing personnel in the nursing home who have um, the legal authority and educational background to assess and plan for residents' care, uh, to supervise the provision of care um, by other nursing staff, and to monitor the health status of residents to avoid adverse outcomes. So the question is, why do our findings about low total nursing staff time and the lack of an RN 24 hours a day in state requirements matter? Well, they matter because inadequate staffing standards harm residents. And I know that uh, many of you in your work see this on, on a daily basis. Um, but I do want to take just some time to describe what it means for residents. 
when the state standard for total nursing staff time is less than the recommended 4.1 hours per resident day. So here's what happens all too often. Residents who need physical assistance or encouragement to eat don't get that help, which leads to unplanned weight loss and can ultimately result in malnutrition. Residents aren't assisted to the toilet when they have to go and are instead told to go in their briefs and that they'll be cleaned up later, except later, uh, maybe many hours later and sometimes um, not at all. Residents aren't turned or repositioned as frequently as their body needs or aren't turned or repositioned at all, resulting in pressure ulcers. Too frequently then the lack of enough staff means that these pressure ulcers aren't treated so they can heal, which can lead to infection, sepsis, hospitalization, and even amputation. Residents lose their ability to do very basic activities for themselves like walk, stand, or sit up because they've been left lying in a bed or sitting in a wheelchair hour after hour. Residents with dementia are given antipsychotic medications inappropriately because there are too few staff to provide the individualized person-centered care residents need when they become distressed. Residents aren't bathed for long periods of time. Their teeth turn brown or become covered with yellow film because they haven't been brushed. Um, their hair is stringy, greasy, and unkempt from not being washed or brushed. And their nails are dirty or so long they curl. I, I could go on, um, but I'll just end by noting that less than 4.1 hours per resident day also can result in preventable contractures, dehydration, incontinence, hospitalizations, falls from lack of supervision and assistance, injuries such as hip fractures, and sometimes even death. With respect to RNs, when state staffing standards don't mandate their presence on site around the clock, the absence of an RN for six hours a day means resident health and well being are jeopardized in two essential ways. One, residents are left without the skills and knowledge of an RN to monitor their condition, anticipate possible changes, prevent complications, and then implement, evaluate, and revise interventions as necessary. Two, there's no one present in the facility capable of assessing and responding when a resident's status suddenly worsens. We know that a resident's condition can destabilize or, or decline at any time. It doesn't necessarily just happen on the day shift. And when that happens, the resident needs to be immediately assessed and a determination made about whether the resident needs to go to the hospital for treatment or whether the resident can be properly cared for in the facility itself. The lack of an RN on site for 16 hours each day, um, or at least the requirement to have one on site, there are some facilities that, that do, as, as Richard pointed out. But when you don't have an RN on site for 16 hours each day, there's no nursing personnel to conduct that assessment that's required for diagnosis and treatment placing the resident in a potentially life-threatening situation. So every day across the country, there are residents suffering as a result of understaffing. We've recognized for decades that the federal staffing standards are inadequate. And now our examination of state staffing standards has shown that they too are weak and insufficient. So despite what is known about the relationship between staffing levels and quality care, despite the fact that we know that at least 4.1 hours per resident day of nursing care um, are needed just to prevent harm or jeopardy to residents, and despite what we know 
about the importance of a registered nurse around the clock, state staffing requirements fall far short of the recommended levels. The one and only exception is DC, which mandates both 4.16 hours per resident per day and an RN around the clock. So I guess in a nutshell, our report reveals that states need to require more nursing in nursing homes. Next slide, please. I think most of us have heard this famous line from the poet uh, Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. As a nation and as states, we do know better yet we are not doing better. That must change. It's our hope at Consumer Voice that this report will spur both state and actually federal governments into action. Residents deserve better. And as Lori said um, in her opening, we owe it to residents. So now, um, Lori, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Robin. So um, thanks to Robin, Charlene, and Richard for um, the terrific presentations, which have really shown and made the case for why we absolutely need federal staffing standards. Um, the current standards we have are insufficient and inadequate. The state standards are not keeping up and are also insufficient and inadequate. Um, there is a big push um, to not include provisions for um, these staffing provisions into the Build Back Better um, uh, Act that is currently pending in Congress. And I think we need to remember that there are significant amounts of public dollars that go to nursing homes, some of which are highlighted on this slide. Medicare and Medicaid are primary payers for the nursing home care that um, residents receive. And nursing facilities received a lot of money through <clears throat> COVID support and relief funds, including a direct uh, money through the CARES Act and um, paycheck protection programs that were available to businesses and in some states, higher reimbursement rates for Medicare and Medicaid um, and other types of support. Um, and we really need to ensure that the money goes towards um, the care of residents and that we're receiving value for the dollars that we are putting publicly into these systems and that they're not being consumed in administrative costs and related party transactions and going for corporate profit. Um, despite the fact that <clears throat> um, the industry continues to talk about um, the lack of money and support that they are getting to um, provide care for residents, I guess a couple things to remember is that they voluntarily agree to participate in Medicare and Medicaid and thus to meet the conditions of participation that include meeting the physical, mental, and psychosocial needs of residents. Um, so it's really critical to know that, you know, they are being paid for, for these issues. And while we talk a lot about Medicaid dollars and Medicaid rates around the country, there may be some states, you know, where the Medicaid rates um, may need to be improved to provide better care. But I think we need to look very carefully at what those rates are. The Medicaid rates vary across the country from state to state. Not every Medicaid rate is insufficient. And there are a lot of facilities that are providing good care and are staffing at appropriate levels um, with the reimbursements that they are receiving. I think what we really need to focus on is ensuring that we're getting good value for the dollars that we're putting into the system and that um, um, and that the care is being provided to residents. Um, Libby, if you could move to the next slide, please. For the amount of money that we're putting into the system, we really need to focus on transparency and accountability for those funds. Build Back Better does provide some provisions related to that. You know, we certainly would like to see all of these provisions go further. Um, and we, we certainly know that we need to require the funds to be spent on resident care. We're seeing some good action in some states right now that are requiring that minimum percentages of revenue be actually paid into resident, uh, be directed towards resident care, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts for example, have done that, we think that needs to happen on a federal level so that we can ensure that a certain percentage of the public dollars that are spent would go towards um, direct care. We think that um, facilities need to provide account 
transparency for how the money is spent and accountability through providing audited consolidated cost reports. Um, right now that's not happening and that would get us um, to better understanding how the money is spent so that we can ensure that reimbursement rates are sufficient. And also if there are proposals for any new dollars to go towards resident care and staff support uh, into this um, industry, they really do need to be dedicated to resident care and staff support. We also really need to be focusing on supporting the caregivers by improving the jobs to attract people into this industry by providing living wages and benefits, by investing in training, addressing turnover, retention and advancement opportunities, and addressing the racial and gender equity and disparity issues um, that currently exist right now um, in order to uh, in order to attract people in and keep people um, in this field and support the staff because it's by supporting the staff that we also will attract people to this field and we know that we're facing um, facing real issues with attracting people um, to nursing homes. Many staff have left because of poor working conditions, um, not just historically, but particularly over the last two years. Um, so as we look forward to moving ahead, we need to be focused on what can we be doing. And um, uh, as we uh, look forward to um, supporting the need for federal staffing standards, um, we certainly need all of you as advocates to be um, encouraging your members of Congress to require the staffing provisions into the Build Back Better bill and to pass those. We need this federal legislation moving forward. Um, and certainly you can be advocating in your states as well. We think that that is really critical. Um, for those of you that are members of congressional staff that are listening in today, we really hope that you will support the, the Build Back Better provisions um, and ensure that we can move forward and receive um, federal staffing standards in order to protect residents and to ensure that they're receiving um, the quality care that they absolutely deserve. Um, we have, um, we're going to run just a little bit over, I think. Um, so if you'll hang with us for just a minute, if you'll go to the next slide, Libby, we had created um, we had held a resident dialogue at our annual conference last month and had residents talking about um, about the conditions that they've been experiencing um, and what they would like to see improved or changed in long term care facilities. And we created this um, video uh, short. It's a very brief clip of a video of residents talking about um, staffing issues in long term care facilities and what it has meant to them. I think because we're so close to the end of the hour, we're not going to play it today, but it will be on our website and it's included as a link in the slides. Um, so if you would um, click on them on our website, you'll be able to access it and it's on our um, staffing page on the Consumer Voice website. But you'll hear directly from residents about what it means to not have adequate staff and how the staff also need to be supported. Um, I think we let's take a couple questions um, since we have uh, Richard, Robin, and Charlene on, um, on the video today. Let's take a couple questions and then we can um, certainly do more um, in this space and uh, work to provide more information to all of you um, who are advocating for residents and certainly do appreciate all of you listening here today. Um, so there were a couple questions related to um, RN uh, numbers. And, um, you know, we're talking about having um, RN presence 24 hours a day. That doesn't only necessarily mean there's only a need for one registered nurse in the building during those times. Um, and maybe Charlene, would you address that a little bit? Um, because I think it's an important um, thing that needs to be talked about. Yes, uh, of course, the, the RN staffing should be based on the resident acuity. It's just that you need an RN on the evening and nights to uh, handle these emergencies and all these other problems uh, that we see. So the acuity, it needs to be the 0.75 hours at a minimum per resident per day. And then it can go up to as high as two or three hours of RN care per resident, depending on the acuity. Great, thanks, Charlene. Um, there were um, questions related to, again, the skill set that um, registered nurses bring. Um, 
and and the differences that they can provide. And I know Charlene, you and Robin had mentioned those with respect to um, the assessments um, and that the uh, RNs are able to provide. Could you just touch on those one more time as well? Well, I mean, RNs are the only ones really able by under the, the law to do assessments and they're the only ones trained and to do the care planning. But it's very important because they're the only ones also trained to do infection control. So, and they are required to be available to supervise the LPNs and the AIDS. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, um, in terms of uh, what are things that folks can be doing in their states if they're, um, if they don't have 4.1, either in their facilities or um, in their states, um, can we talk a little bit about some of the advocacy steps that folks can take and Richard or Robin, um, would you be willing to kind of address some of the things that people can do to advocate for their loved ones? I can um, start off um, and um, uh, suggest, and um, I'm going to defer then to Richard, but use the wonderful um, data that is available through the PBJ and that um, um, Richard's organization um, analyzes so beautifully. So because you can drill down to your state, you can drill down ultimately to your to a particular facility um, and look at what you know, what the data say and compare it to what the recommended standards are and then start making the case for the fact that, you, uh, well, we know that there's only one, one state that, that does require, the, or DC is the only one. So make the case for um, uh, raising the staffing levels to at least, you know, 4.1 and to at least one RN um, round the clock. Um, then in addition to the data, um, gather stories. We, we know that hearing directly um, from residents and families and ombudsmen about what is happening um, on the ground in facilities to residents puts the human face on that data. So together with the data and, and the stories, um, you know, start making public presentations, go to your legislators um, and lay it out for them. Um, and start asking um, for long regulation that will increase the staffing standards in your state. Um, we know it can be done. Um, just uh, this past year, um, there have been um, uh, a few states that have actually managed to increase their, their staffing standards. So it can be done. And um, I think as this uh, presentation shows, it should be done. And so I don't know if Richard would like to add anything about the, his wonderful data. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Um, so yeah, I mean, as Robin said, it's all available on the website. You could see it for the most recent quarter. You could sign up for updates and get alerts when it comes up. Uh, and they're all in really easy to use and we're increasingly making them, working to make them easier to use and to, uh, to use for your advocacy. As I mentioned before, you, they also can be broken down very easily into counties. You can select the counties that are in your uh, congressperson's district or your legislator's district. I would just quickly add to what Robin said is that the industry has really powerful lobbyists. There are two national associations that are each sitting on $30 million uh, roughly. And in the states, especially big states like New York, Texas, California, et cetera, there are very active multiple um, provider associations. And those people are talking to your legislators every day. Uh, it's so important to, as Robin said, if you can make a visit, make a visit, there's nothing better than that. But if you don't have the time, make a phone call and use the data and use a personal story, as Robin was saying, to bring home that, that you count and your resident counts and that it's important that they pay attention. Thank you, Richard, um, and thank you to Robin and Charlene. Um, I know that uh, we're over time and appreciate you all um, uh, joining us today and for your excellent presentations. The, um, the recording and the slides for today will be posted to the Consumer Voice website. Um, we'll be doing more on this issue. I think 
Um, certainly, you know, timing is critical for us to focus on ensuring that we have adequate staffing. And we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we have a we have an opportunity right now to get some legislation forward that would move us forward in the direction of having um, sufficient staffing standards um, and really um, identifying um, what that could mean in a better way. And so we need to take advantage of this opportunity. So please contact your members of Congress um, and for those members of uh, con congressional staff that are listening, please do um, in include and encourage your bosses to include this, this language in. We're happy to provide additional information and resources and we'll um, make that available on our websites. Um, someone had asked, um, even though some people may be able to, um, may need to leave that we show the resident recording at the end. And so why don't we queue that up? So those of you who are willing to stay, it's less than five minutes. Um, but if you're willing to stay and watch it, we invite you to do that. And it's also, again, on our website. So Libby, if you will show that as we close out. And thanks so much to all of you for participating today. Well, I think in, in my facility that if they can improve on the staffing level, um, you know, because that I think would help with infection control because mm -hmm. when you have two CNAs covering 60 residents, you know, it's very difficult to be as tight with infection control as it should be. Because there's two CNAs for for 60 residents? 60 residents, yes. Wow. And that's usually every shift. Mm -hmm. And I think that if they increase their wages, that would help as well. Okay. So if they're able to take care and of the basics, then they could start to address things that would that would maybe help your quality of life. Correct. Is that, am I hearing that right? It's almost the staffing is worse than the pandemic itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's very staffing, that's very huge. straining on the staff on the CNAs, yeah. you know, which trickles down to us. Sure, obviously. Yeah. Um, we have been very short staffed this entire year. People are leaving in every department. Um, we're down to, I would say, between a quarter to half staff of what we used to have. Wow. Um, during the third shift, we've got um, a nurse who's taking care of at least 35 patients um, to the, between where I am and a floor above me. Wow. Um, about, but we have, uh, yeah, 20 residents to an aid. And um, if you are needing more assistance than one person, it means long wait times. Um, so that increase in, in, um, in staffing would be, would be, um, great. Uh, only have two girls on, our aides, and sometimes they're on split shift, but they have to go upstairs and there's 22 people on a floor. So it sometimes makes it bad. You know, the ratio per resident, there are many days where I have 10 minutes or less per day um, with an aide. And, um, you know, it's usually about 10 minutes per day per nurse. Um, or, um, I'm sorry, per day with the nurse. And I would actually like to see a federal mandated laws that protect our nursing homes uh, that would say that there can only be so many residents per nurse, so many residents per CNA. I believe that the prison population has stricter rules than nursing homes. 
Um, so I think that's something that's badly needed that uh, our, our nursing staff, uh, in, in case of an emergency, if there's a full code and there's not enough nurses, you have to um, worry that your family member is not gonna get seen or get taken care of. Um, yeah. So I really do believe that we need to do something about that legislatively. Thanks so much and thanks for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to continuing to advocate with all of you and um, and uh, please um, keep in touch with us and uh, want to thank again Richard, Charlene and Robin for their excellent presentations today. Um, go to our website for more information and for a copy of the information that we shared with you today. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you.